Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to my final attempt to try and loudly and publicly work through my complicated feelings on the open world video game genre and mm -hmm. how it relates to the industry as a whole. Those of you who have known me, uh, those of you who've known me long enough have already been subjected to multiple rants on this topic, so I'm sorry. Uh, on that note, who the hell am I? I'm Shimon. I make games. I write about them sometimes. I make games with names like City of Piss and a bar where men go to be turned into horses. I'm being paid by the work mob. I have no credentials. Disclaimers! Don't let me yuck your gum. It's okay to like things that I'm going to say are bad. It's okay to like things that are objectively bad. I like, th I like things that I say are bad, and I like things that, I, that are objectively bad. Also, uh, I don't know what a Harvard is. I am not an academic. I have sources, but I will not be citing them. Just, <laughs> just trust me, bro. So, first off, what the heck is an open world game anyway? Um, the thing I need to get out of the gate is that open world does not literally mean a world that is open or a world where you can go where you want. In the same way that a JRPG is kind of, oh, sorry, an RPG in general, a role-playing game is kind of a misnomer. The word's literal meaning is not the genre thing. So uh, let's try and define this a little bit more specifically. So uh, open world games are a structure, a structural characteristic even. So um, in comparison to traditional forms of level design where you have these handcrafted specific places with a finite and set number of paths between them um, that are being sort of constructed for maximum efficacy and whatnot, you have this sort of large open traversal area with little nodes of content on them that you're free to generally experience in any perceivable order. There are sometimes ways to gate these things off a little bit more using some traditional level design techniques, but like broadly speaking, yeah, you've got this sort of omnidirectional way of experiencing the world. Um, mm -hmm. In many ways, that makes it kind of a very elaborate level select. Uh, so content in an open world doesn't make as many assumptions about where you've been, what you've done, what you know. It also can't make any assumptions about what, you, what you've done, what you know, where you've been, because there's no restriction on what order you can experience it in. Essentially, it places designed experiences with a strong control and vision and mind in tension with the idea of freely engaging with the world. Open world games are also a workflow. Um, so, Generally speaking, a 3D open world game like your AAA ones will first create what's called a hype map, this sort of naturalistic terrain. Uh, often this is done procedurally, like with a computer, not necessarily by hand, and then the designers will go in and find the, the valleys, the peaks, the places that draw the eye and the attention, and that's where they'll guide where they place things. Um, so usually the sort of human element is largely present in the um, the specifics of like where props and stuff are. That's not always true. There are games like say uh, Pokemon Legends Arceus where it's really obvious that it's being all made by hand because it's like very transparently artificial. But generally speaking, this is how these kinds of games are made. Um, those sorts of props are always made using these sort of modular kits. This is true of all AAA games, but because of the nature of the scale of the thing and because of the way that an open world game allows you to work on parts of this game in isolation with each other and not be worried that they're going to contradict or undermine each other in some way. Um, it's like <clears throat> way more possible to and way more incentivized to really, really rely on these sorts of ultra reusable, ultra modular <clears throat> types of kits. Uh, open world games are an economic decision. So the truly the only economically viable way to make a game that is actually massive, not you can create the impression of scale in various ways, but to create a map that is geographically, you know, from meter to meter, massive, you're going to have to employ these sorts of techniques. There are kinds of games that are simply cursed. We do not have the technology now, maybe ever, and the resources to actually like create them in the way that we envision them in our mind with bespoke stuff everywhere, but also total freedom. It's just, if it's not literally impossible, it's technically impossible. Um, we see this a lot also in like indie games with uh, simulationist kind of uh, ambitions like Hello Neighbor is a very funny example of a game that went through 100,000 different iterations and you can actually see in real time this dev team slowly realizing that like there's a reason why there isn't already a game where uh, your, your like 
facing up against one guy that is super intelligent and learns from every single thing you do and the level constantly changes to account for the ways that you've tried to act in the past and mm -hmm. it slowly got filed down over time into its current form which is basically like four or so levels of like a first person puzzler kind of thing um, it's just not really feasible um the only successful implementations of this kind of thing that i've seen are decades-long fan works that are built on games that one already exist and two are like old and simple enough to facilitate going really crazy with your design work so the example i have here is a rom pad for pokemon crystal called crystal clear where uh, you can now face any of the gym leaders any of the challenges in the world in any order and the world like everything scales up to account for that so that's like eight factorial like permutations of um, boss fights that you didn't do, that's insane. You couldn't do that if you cared at all about money, either spending it or getting it. Um, and if you had anything other than like this basis of game that was literally already made. Uh, cool, so on the scale of AAA games, basically like competition and profit and market conditions um, necessitates that they go bigger and better every time, which is why we lose sight of these kinds of like small uh, handcrafted elements uh which dovetails into it's also a marketing move bigger is better bigger is impressive it's really easy to communicate to a player to a customer that you've done iteration and improvement over time by just showing them how much more stuff there is um it's a lot harder and more abstract to communicate that you've thought about your design maybe you know, thought of some new mechanics or ways to improve on the ones that are already there and the way that i think of it is like anything that theoretically could have popped into your head fully formed um is basically useless in communicating to a customer that like money has been spent on the right thing you know theoretically you could have just come up with the idea for a game but you obviously can't magically conjure up a hundred hours of stuff so um that's the primary way in which developers in AAA contexts tend to communicate like value. Um, and because everyone's doing it, if you don't do it, you look like a goddamn chump. You look like an asshole. Uh, so we, there's a kind of an arms race element to it where everyone's looking at a way to either go open world to compete or find a way to differentiate themselves from needing to do that enough to like secure their own existence or be comfortable in mediocrity, which uh, shareholders don't let you do. So cool, great. What's good about them? Uh, I think that discovery is like the most potent feeling that a game can evoke. And it's also a thing that is unique to games, more or less, um, because you have ownership over your actions. And so finding a thing is like you have found a thing. You can spot details that you would have otherwise missed. But there is an element to this that is unique in the game sort of context. And uh, open world games are uniquely good at this because you are doing things in you know whichever way you see fit so uh you have more ownership of those discoveries and that's a running theme is feeling ownership of your victories uh in general so you give players more freedom and very importantly more responsibility to find their own solutions to problems um this is often a way that like emergent gameplay kind of comes into these things um meaning basically ways that the designers didn't explicitly intend or create a way of engaging with your game, but which arise naturally as a result of like all the different factors coming together in player action. Um, so, you know, like Tears of the Kingdom is basically built entirely around that. You've got all these different systems for building all these different parts. They've defined what the parts do, but they haven't defined what the machines do as a whole. And so you don't just have various silly shapes you can make, you also have put the potential to find interactions that weren't even thought possible. And maybe they patch those out or maybe they leave them in because they're awesome. Speedrunners, regardless, will have a field day. Um, and the Dwarf Fortress thing here is just like, Dwarf Fortress is kind of the poster child for emergence in games because like, their game is just all systems, 100 billion gorillion systems. And the famous one is that for some reason, cats started drinking alcohol on mass and dying um, in one of the updates. And they had to, they, you know, they didn't program cats to do that, but it happened as a result of whatever was going on there. And they had to go in and fix that because all the cats were dying. Um, it's really good. So uh, next thing, 
Problems can be left and revisited. It's a lot harder to hit a brick wall when you can simply turn around and go somewhere else. Hit bricks. This makes your games also a bit more accessible because like hitting a brick wall is not a pleasant experience and for a lot of players, it's not something they care to experience full stop. We're not all into that kind of like souls, um, you know, bashing your head against a boss for like three hours until you finally triumph. Uh, and that's totally cool. And lastly, uh, there's a very potent sense of place that comes from open world games because you're very naturalistically moving throughout this world and also the impression of scale creates a stronger feeling that you're like a guy in a place that is a lot bigger than you. What's bad about it? Nothing, inherently, anyways. <laughs> um, broadly, they represent a move away from control, tightness of experience, and quote-unquote game designerly approaches to teaching, storytelling, <laughs> spectacle, and escalation. And now we're on to something I call the mono genre. So franchises keep going open world. Um, there are a lot of shared characteristics between these kinds of big budget open world games specifically enough that they are essentially the face of the idea of an open world game. Um, they're the things that are being, that are inspiring open world games being made. They're the things that they're being compared to. And I think they are deserving of a sort of sub genre, which I call derisively the mono genre. So, oop. yeah. So what is the mono genre? Uh, the first thing is that core gameplay for these franchises is usually maintained completely as one-to-one -one as possible. They're not designing from the ground up with this new structure in mind and what it offers. Uh, a notable exception is Breath of the Wild, <laughs> which is kind of responsible for why we're here in this mess, in my opinion, because it actually cared. Um, it invented that sort of climbing and gliding loop that a bunch of games afterwards plundered in its entirety because it ruled like Sable and, um, and Genshin Impact and stuff like that. Um, yeah, they redesigned their combat from the ground up to be less focused on like the Zelda traditional idea of basically like you have this iconic sword and this iconic shield and people you know were a little bit mad about that but they focused on the strengths of this format by focusing on like emergence and uh, improvisation there are more weapon types your weapons break constantly you have to find new ones often in the heat of the moment and scramble to make these fights uh, happen and there are various tools that like interact with the world in, and, and fights in a very similar sort of interesting way. Um, you know, you've got bombs that don't deal a lot of damage, but do a lot of like physics-y things, knock things away. Uh, and that's pretty neat. Um, but yeah, so, and there's also a lot of environmental systems, right? Like thunder and rain and uh, fire propagation that all just serve to create this. Um, but even in the case of a game like Breath of the Wild, Franchises still have an obligation to their lineage to like one please the fans to sort of uphold the imagery and the vibe of the thing so um, They're still being designed from this angle of like how can we fit Zelda into an open world game? Which is not inherently a bad thing, but it's definitely limiting Next up uh, we have a focus on extrinsic motivation for exploration you gotta get stuff, you gotta level up, you gotta find XP and get your plus five lightning resist. Uh, you've got various, you know, items that with incremental upgrades in your, like, Borderlands and Skyrim. You've got perk trees in your Assassin's Creeds and stuff. Final Fantasy VII Remake is not technically an open world game, but I just, it, it's funny. <laughs> um, uh, the point is, like, not that progression systems are inherently bad or that they're inherently manipulative. I'm not really interested in arguing where the line is between like extrinsic motivation and in you know, a toxic way or in an interesting way. Um, but they are a crutch that is used to make what is otherwise like samey, um, samey content that doesn't have as much of a personal touch by any one person like palatable over a longer period of time. And lastly we have, uh, I think not lastly, but we have this thing that I call the familiarity horizon. So, AAA open world games, because of the economic marketing reasons, are always going to be made as big as they possibly can, using the assets they have as economically and as broadly as possible. And so, these games always have a point before uh, the end, where the players have essentially seen everything the game has to offer, right? <clears throat> Not on a literal level, but in terms of the 
the tricks in terms of the mechanical side of things, um, you've more or less <clears throat> run the well dry, at least in like 80% of the things you do. And when there's nothing new to learn or find, exploration becomes interesting, particularly because these games have gone out of their way to make the whole thing structured around these kinds of extrinsic rewards. So essentially, you have to find your own fun or you burn out. This happened to me, for example, in Breath of the Wild when I got to the, my fourth area. The, the game's roughly divided into four areas, um, <clears throat> which was, for me was the greater area. When I realized that like every item I was gonna get from here on out was at best a reskin of something worse than what I already have. Um, and I've already got like enough health and enough stamina and whatever to last me until the very, very end. Um, despite not going out of my way to try and become too powerful. So I'm like, okay, well, I don't really give a shit about almost anything that's happening now. I'm going to go do all the stuff that I know in front of me is unique, which was basically the main quest, and just blast through it. So I didn't really experience too much of this area. Um, yeah. So these games also tend to be caught between the desire to be linear, grand, narrative adventures, and free player-driven experiences. Skyrim is a game that desperately wants to just be a like completely open, explore, do whatever the hell you want kind of thing, more akin to like the really early Elder Scrolls games. But it's also feeling obligated to have you this epic quest with a like engaging main story that is both great for the marketing, great for awards and stuff like that. And so you have this dissonance where you're off collecting cabbages, becoming the leader of five different factions, solving the civil war, all the while, you're supposed to feel the imminent threat of a dragon destroying the actual universe, um, and you're the only one who can stop them, and you're just kind of fighting around. <laughs> For another example, Cyberpunk 2077 <laughs> desperately wants to be this tight, linear RPG, maybe like an immersive sim akin to like a Deus Ex, where you're, you're chilling with Keanu Reeves and going on these beautiful cinematic scripted sequences, but it's also enslaved to the open world marketing that accompanied its like initial announcement ages before it's released, ages before it even got started on development for real. And so that whole thing is quite shallow and tacked on. And like, you know, you can see with, for example, the DLC that's released since it came out, which is actually pretty well acclaimed. They don't care about the open world shit in that DLC. Like they, they minimize it because that's clearly not the point for them, or at least not what they discovered as the point of the game. Um, but yeah, these are essentially all defined by having these two modes of linear play and free play. Um, the free play serves to muddy the themes and the characterization of the linear segments, as well as having players like forget what was even happening. You can't create the same rise and fall of tension and emotion when in between each individual plot beat, the player goes off and spends five hours doing whatever the hell they want. Um, and the linear segments serve to undermine the experience of free play, either by forcing you to engage with them, and players might not necessarily want to, or creating the feeling of obligation by just having them know that every second they spend having fun doing their own thing is the second that the world could be getting closer to being destroyed by the big evil dragon. So, fundamentally, I believe that the mono genre is a result of like economic and practical concerns, rather than what open worlds actually bring to video games, and they're burdened with unimaginative game loops, bloated construction, and a lot of vestigial legacy features coming from the fact that they're largely like existing franchises adapted to this new format. So, what does a good one look like then? We talk plenty about things that suck, uh, and I will give you one last thing. I think that nearly every AAA open world sucks on a fundamental level. <laughs> Not that they can't be fun, but that, again, if we're looking at them from the perspective of do they utilize this idea in like a thoughtful and useful way, the answer is generally no. So, sense of place. Uh, your world is the main character of your game. Uh, you should let it be more than just a level select. Personality, theme, and a sense of continuity and persistence between things, the sense that the world exists beyond you. Um, which can just be a feeling or can be implemented in a more like serious way. Uh, for all the shit I give Bethesda, simply walking around Skyrim is like one of my favorite things to do in any video game. Um, hence the constant reappearance of the multiple swamps. Uh, I stand. So um, I think that like a lot of indie open worlds without much in the way of intense gameplay, uh, like Sable, really focus on this element and you can basically construct an entire experience around just like emphasizing that sense of place that comes from scale 
um, and traversal, and it's really good. Next, uh, the emphasis on player-driven exploration and discovery. Um, discovery should always be rewarded in a way that's meaningful. Uh, this can be extrinsically like motivated through perks and shit like that, but it should also be at least narratively meaningful and contributing to a greater goal in a clear way. Um, even if that's simple as having a checklist of places to visit and things to do. Outer Wilds is basically the best game ever made. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons for that is that your reward for everything you do in this game is just information. Like, there are no, there are no perks, there's no you know, permanent character improvement, no stuff like that. Everything you do is in the service of learning, and that learning allows you to go more places, do more things, not in some kind of mechanically gated way. It's just the sort of thing where like, you realize the entire time, theoretically, you could have immediately gone to this place and done this thing. You just didn't know yet. And because of that, like, it feels so special and powerful, and like every single discovery is turning your entire understanding of the world on its head. Um, there's something about knowing that you could have always done the thing that also just like really hits in this game in particular. So, world mastery. Um, being free to navigate a world in whichever way you want means that there's room to experience that and sort of have a change in nature over time. Uh, you should create room for skill growth and new options slash abilities in the way that you traverse the world. Don't keep that the same all the way throughout. Um, you should reward the player for understanding the world, how it's structured and what's in it, even if that's as simple as just like knowing a new faster way to get back to somewhere you visited before, maybe discovering a shortcut, something along those lines. And uh, use fast travel extremely sparingly because it risks turning your elaborate level select into a literal level select where now everything has been stripped of context because you can just move between the places where the things happen. This part is the reason why you make an open world game, and so you should never do anything to undermine the feeling of that traversal. Um, yep, yeah, so uh, credit to Linda Q, uh, which is kind of the reason that I made this presentation in the first place, uh, because it came out in the 90s. This is a JRPG that came out in the 90s and just got translated by like a fan patch. And uh, it is doing the open world thing better than like every game that has come out in the past 20 years. Um, it is, it, it, it's actually infuriating. Uh, it's like, what have we been fucking doing this whole time? Um, and it essentially made me like reshape my entire thoughts on this from like open world suck to like, oh, this is a very specific kind of open world that has poisoned our brains and we actually need to search for the holy land that is Land Cube. Uh, we need to bring it back. Linda Sweet. Um, but essentially this game like beautifully escalates this idea of world mastery over three sort of sub playthroughs or scenarios where in the first one you're mostly exploring this world on your own terms, finding new things, uh, discovering like various bits of information, and then over the other two scenarios you're being expected to demonstrate it, right? Where by the final scenario you essentially are expected to enact a plan for navigating this entire world and doing this list of tasks in like the most efficient way possible because your time limit is really fucking short and it is absolutely electric. It's amazing. <laughs> um, and it makes, you know, all this time we've spent just walking from place to place so meaningful because like the, you know, the way that you learn that like you can just cross this ice during winter to go from this town to this town straight away, like it's, it's suddenly imbued with this real meaning beyond just like, I'm, I'm bored, I want to go to the, the content faster, right? Uh, you have this sense of ownership of the, the mastery you're demonstrating in this game, as well as like, well, you know, none of these mechanics are being uh, forced into your face or like, and a lot of things are hidden or just not even hidden, but left for you to find. So yeah, this sense of ownership of your victories is, is, uh, is super, super powerful. Context, lean into verisimilitude in everything, but particularly your mechanics. Make sure they enhance your narrative and your sense of place. If possible, try not to abstract things too much. So Dragon's Dogma 2, which came out since I wrote this, so I, don't, I haven't played it and I don't have anything to say about the specifics of it, but one of the big things they were talking about in the interviews leading up to release is that, is that the, uh, the fast travel system, much like old MMOs, requires you to actually get in a car and sit there while you get taken to the place. It's still a faster form of travel, but um, there is 
you know, there's verisimilitude there, and it's also sort of hooked into these games like various random events. So your cart can get attacked by a griffin that likes to eat ox because ox are the things that carry the carts. Um, and that, that's really cool. It doesn't have to be that, like, borderline hostile. I think, for example, just the cards that you see outside of City and Skyrim are a fantastic example of, like, making fast travel good because... One, you have to go to a specific place to use them. You can't just decide you're bored in the middle of an adventuring trip and teleport wherever you want. You, you have a limited list of places you can go, uh, and those places make sense in the context of the world. You can go to various different major cities, uh, and they also cost a bit of money, not a lot, but the fact that it costs anything at all enhances that sense of place, um, and the costs are different based on where you're going. Um, and yeah, like it's, it's just it's great. It's, it's super, super good. Uh, even though at the end of the day, like you are just hitting a loading screen and then you end up in the place instantly. That's totally fine. Um, player indifference and emergence. This is the last one. So this might be a little like difficult to sort of communicate in a really clear way, but you want to present a world rather than a straightforward series of challenges. You should be creating systems that produce unique and unexpected results for both the player and the designer. Um, so the intersection of multiple systems and unique scenarios and unexpected factors result in these sort of flashpoint moments where essentially like the player can tell, you know, in this instant that like they're experiencing something that maybe no one else has done before. Um, or, and at the, at the bare minimum, they couldn't have possibly anticipated that when they showed up there, the sword that they had just broke, lightning is starting to strike. They have to take, they have to strip naked, take all their metal armor off so they don't get struck by lightning. Their weapons broke, they have to pick something up off the ground. Uh, a barrel is being thrown at them. Oh, uh, lightning just struck one of the towers. It's now on fire. It's spreading across the grass. Like, that is beautiful. Um, and this is why I think that the whole rain and storm system in Breath of the Wild is actually good, even though it constantly is just like, you're not going to climb up this mountain now. Um, because, yeah, it, it creates these moments in the same way Far Cry 2, I scroll back a little bit, oh, nope. Yeah, Far Cry 2 is like very well acclaimed for having this really advanced fire propagation, not just for the time, but in general. And like, you know, through this sort of thing, you've turned what was once just like a bunch of static objects that function as a shooting gallery into this real place where things are like falling apart. The situation is rapidly deteriorating for both you and your foes. It, it kicks off. Um, you should provide the tools to solve problems, don't, but don't prescribe which tool is for which problem, give everything various uses in order to facilitate that kind of choosing your own adventure, um, and allow the player to both brush up against challenges that they're incapable of overcoming thus far, but also, very importantly, allow them to trivialize challenges that should be like impossible for them by being very clever or very lucky. Uh, to sort of circle back to our friend Margaret here from Elden Ring, he's ostensibly like the first real boss of the game, and he's very hard, and you can always leave and come back later and like kick his ass, but there are also, there's an item somewhere in the world that you can find that will immobilize him for a period of time and make this fight so much easier. And it's so, so good that they added this, because not only does it like enhance your sense of this character in the world, it also means you get to feel like a goddamn if not a genius, then like a master adventurer for finding this thing and coming back, right? For having the, the presence of mind to like sort of shop around first rather than bang your head against this wall for hours. Um, it's really good. And if you're thinking about your game as fundamentally wanting to create strong memories and strong emotions, um, then you should be willing to let something you spent hundreds of hours on get completely trounced in a moment. Um, because, yeah, as long as the experience is, like, memorable, this is the thing that people are going to tell their friends about, you know? And you shouldn't forget that. So, that's all that. The last question I feel obligated to answer is, why do I care so much? So, partly I'm deranged and I, uh, I hate fun. <laughs> um, but lately, I've had a little devil whispering in my ear. And he tells me something bad. He tells me something terrible. He says, you should try and make one. Uh, sir, I'll see you in 10 years, I guess. <laughs> um, that's my presentation. Thank you. Uh, if you want to see where my hubris takes me, I made a newsletter recently, and I will be documenting every way in which I get my ass kicked.
<laughs> Questions, if anyone has any. Yeah, fair enough. Oh, all right. How do we access the brilliance that is the Uh, okay, all right, so you're going to have to legally get a ROM of the base game in Japanese from a legal website called Vim's Lab, um, where legal things happen. And essentially the patch is in like a GitHub somewhere. I can post it in the Discord or quite send it to you specifically if you want. But you literally just like click a button and it patches the ROM and now everything's in English. And what uh, it's for the It's for the PlayStation 1. It's, it's seriously so good, like, I, it's changed my life, both for the better and potentially for the worse, we'll see. Um, amazing stuff. Hi, how do you feel, like, you brought up the time talk, but like, the mix of, like, open world games, go around, do things, and the character agency and urgency be caused by, like, those more lane narratives. And, like, that sort of, like, split between, like, this story probably requires some sort of urgency to give it meaning, but also as a player, I want to spend as much time as I can. Yeah, so um, I think that uh, it's definitely not a, a inherently contradictory set of goals. I think in the case of something like Skyrim, the issue is not that there is pressure and you can do your own thing. The issue is that it has this long, narratively driven, linear plot with a set of characters that do specific things and go to specific places and begin with a moment of imminent danger. Um, that, and you, also you can do everything else. Like, they're, they're like bifurcated in that way, right? They don't, they don't exist in relation to each other. Um, and this is another thing that Lindacube does really well uh, <laughs> because that game is built around having a time limit, having a sense of urgency and everything. Um, and the way that it one gives you time to fuck around and have fun is by giving you different scenarios right, that have different amounts of time pressure, but also inherently like being given time pressure, but also being set free to do whatever, like you're going to find some fun there. You're going to be able to have access to that inherent fun of like and silliness and stuff. Um, so yeah, I really think it's like, it's just about thinking of these things as being married together, not thinking of them as being like separate. Okay. Alright, I'm so done.